I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is TCS Plus, brought to you by Tech Central. You find us on techcentral.co.za or subscribe to the show on youtube.com slash techcentral. Hit the subscribe button and the bell icon, and you'll never miss another episode. Now, my guest in the studio today is Karen Foss. Karen is Senior Manager for Crypto at Ultron Systems Integration. Now, Karen, just for clarity, when we say crypto in this case, we're not talking about Bitcoin. We're talking no. about cryptography and information security, which is your area of expertise. Correct. Good. Well, tell me a bit about yourself, Karen. How long have you been with Ultron now? Have you always been in the security field? Well, I've been with Ultron for 13 years. I was actually at a company um, from 2001 to 2006 called Nemetech. It was then Nemetech. acquired by yeah. Altec at that stage, which mm. obviously became Ultron at a later point. Um, in my time at Namitech, I dealt with all facets of information security, um, whether it be PKI, biometric solutions, etc. Um, I was then approached by IBM. I moved to IBM and I focused more predominantly on the identity and access management space. Um, and then when I got to a point where I was tired of the blue tape, as I call it, at IBM, okay. um, Ultron had approached me a number of times leading to that point, and I thought, well, rather the devil you know than the devil you don't. <laughs> so I came back to Ultron. Um, I started focusing on infrastructure security, PKI, TLS certificates, etc. And then, but in my time at Nemetech, at one point in those five years I was there, we were given the um, distribution agency for NSAF at the time, mm -hmm. which is hardware security modules. And they looked around, they said, hmm, we need somebody to run with this product. Oh, Karen, can you do it? Um, so I said, yes. I still remember my first meeting at Standard Bank where I was up against Peter Bonfrey, who was basically known as Mr. Tellus South Africa. Um, his focus had been cryptography basically his entire life. And I walked out of that meeting thinking, hmm, I will never be in a position where I am not speaking from a point of, author of authority. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I took the product on. I got to understand it. And I actually won that deal over Peter Bonfrey, which <laughs> he um, doesn't enjoy to this day. <laughs> so in my time, at, uh, when I moved back to Ultron, I obviously had a passion for the crypto environment. And in fact, the customers that I dealt with were largely the same as the ones Peter Bonfrey dealt with. So he was my general manager. Um, he focused on the um, hardware security module space. And I focus on the other solutions, um, public key infrastructure and the like. Peter Bonfrey was reached retirement age and then some. He managed to get a couple of extra years. Um, and in the interim, I moved into Ultron Security. And 20 months ago, I was approached to look after the crypto division. So I moved into this position and for the last 20 months, it's definitely been um, quite a roller coaster ride, to say the least. Um, there's been a lot of changes in the channel. The, the OEM being TELUS mm -hmm. in this case, um, they had a lot of changes in terms of their distribution model, their channel model. We had to respond to a um, tender in September last year, so we were awarded um, distribution for Africa for the entire CPL product suite, which is customer protection licensing. So not only do we focus on hardware security modules, but we also have access to the general purpose HSMs as well as the data protection suite of products. So... A large part of our focus has obviously been to build that new, all those new uh, markets that we weren't privy to before, mm -hmm. um, and that's where we that's where I find myself today. 
All right. Well, tell, tell me a bit about um, Ultron Systems Integration Security Practices Crypto Division that you look after, uh, how it works with clients, uh, who the client, what the client profile typically looks like, and what sort of solutions you're selling into corporate South Africa. Sure. So, with the Telus, so my division has got a element of direct selling. Mm-hmm. on specific solutions like the DigiSuit. We still do the public key infrastructure in TLS. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the TELUS and the interest side, we predominantly focus on hardware security modules. So in essence, from where you swipe your card to pay for a purchase that you probably shouldn't be making, to the core banking system, we encrypt that traffic Mm -hmm. so that you cannot have a man in the middle attack. We also, the general purpose HSM focuses more on specific bespoke solutions where customers have a requirement and a solution is built around that. So you do quite a bit of system integration type work as well? Not us, but going back to what you were saying, we work through ch- through the channel. So we have okay. a number of channel partners throughout Africa. Obviously, some countries are a little bit more challenging to deal with than others. But the African market is, well, the entire market is predominantly financial services. But if you look at it from this perspective, we your telcos are becoming financial service Mm. providers, your retailers. Um, And then when you start getting into the data protection products, when you've got regulatory compliance being as important as it is right now, Mm -hmm. um, between GDPR, PAPIA, HIPAA, obviously for the health sector, that that touches every single industry. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Because if you don't protect those crime jewels, there are implications to um, not protecting your sensitive data. And obviously for every organization, that sensitive data or the definition thereof is different. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't shouldn't in this day and age, though, companies be encrypting by default rather than looking at specific things or areas where they are worried about security? Should they not just encrypt everything? Is that not practical? It's not practical because if you had to encrypt everything, obviously there's a very fine line between meeting security compliance and ensuring that business as usual continues to run without additional overload. Mm -hmm. If you look at the banking fraternity, they talk seconds in terms of performance latency. So encrypting everything is not practical. Takes too long. But if you have to focus on what is important in your organization, whether it be financials or credit card data or personal information for customers, I think the biggest challenge for most companies that are not as proficient in terms of data protection is identifying which data is most important to protect. Yeah, yeah. And that's certainly what we've picked up. We've had a number of roundtables um, with very different industries. And invariably what happens is your development team will develop applications. They don't build security in it, into it. It becomes an afterthought. Mm. And then by the time it reaches the compliance team, the compliance team says, but hang on. You haven't built the security measures into the code, um, and that obviously leads to delays in terms of taking new applications to market. Mm. Should companies be thinking security first when they build any new project these days? 100%. You know, and if you think about it, South Africans are very used to security measures. Mm. I mean, if you look at our physical homes, we've got whether it be electric fencing, boomed off areas, armed response, high walls, then you've got beams. And then if you've got really important jewelry or whatever the case may be, you've got safes. Mm. That is a defense in depth strategy. Now in information security, it's very much the same. So you've got your infrastructure security, which is your firewalls, antivirus. Um, But then 
as you go closer to what is most important to the company, mm-hmm. that is where encryption plays a very important role. And I see it as your last um, form of defense. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. I do wonder, um, uh, you, I mean, you must have to deal with a lot of legacy systems. 100%. In the big banks and that sort of thing. And and providing modern encryption solutions on top of those legacy solutions is probably quite technically complicated. Is, is that a big challenge you find? It is a challenge, but um, if you when you get to the large banks with legacy systems, invariably they've got very efficient development teams. Mm. They're used to those legacy systems. And they've got middleware layers that they you can plug into. 100%. So, I mean, if you look at the big banks, KP Tech managed to gain such a big presence in the market and become the fifth largest bank mm-hmm. because they didn't have all those legacy systems to deal with, all the infrastructure yeah. to deal with. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the other big four banks did have all of that. Yeah, yeah. So it must be it must be quite challenging though to layer these security solutions on top of all this legacy infrastructure. Um, uh, and I imagine that's a lot, a lot of the work you do. Well, obviously from our perspective, because we're distribution, we are – Invariably, one step removed from the end sure. customer. But your partners will be doing that. But we work, work very closely with partners and end users where the um, requirements is there. Um, my, in my team, we have technical resources to support our partners and customers. Um, and we do that very well. Mm-hmm. We're going to go through uh, encryption in, 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 quite, in quite a bit more detail now, but I, I wanted to ask you a question which, which is interesting me, um, and I, it may still be years, if not decades off, but I hear a lot of talk about how quantum computing is going to blow up a security industry that um, 128, 256-bit encryption keys today will be no problem for a quantum computer, which will simply break them in a matter of seconds, maybe minutes. Are we heading towards some sort of, uh, um, I mean, are we heading into an arms race here now with, with cyber crooks who are going to start to use these very advanced tools to break down these encryption and security technologies that we've put in place? Are we, are we heading for some sort of nightmare scenario in the next few years um, enabled by quantum computing? Well, if you take a step back and you look at security, information security now compared to 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, your cyber criminals are actually motivated by money. Yeah. If they manage to steal your data, encrypt it, hold it for ransom, that's how they get paid. So obviously cyber criminals, the threat landscape is constantly evolving um, and changing because the cyber criminals have to become one step ahead. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we're not oblivious to this fact, and we have to, as um, in terms of the OEMs, they have to stay one step ahead. Mm. Quantum computing is very much the same. There are already measures in place to mitigate the risk of quantum computing. So we've so. With any luck with anything, I mean, if you look at technology 10 years ago versus now, we are probably the same place we were where we mm. took a hundred years before that yeah. to evolve to. Yeah, the threat landscape has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. I, I remember my first introduction to anything cybersecurity related, I was still at school, I think, uh, was uh, getting a computer virus on my on my uh, DOS computer. It was a bouncing ball <laughs> that bounced around on the screen. I don't think it did anything else. And certainly we've come a heck of a long way since then, and the adversaries have become a lot more sophisticated, but so have the so have the companies that are fighting uh, c- c- cybercrime. Um, and ransomware has certainly been a big issue over the last year in South Africa. We've seen a number of headlines of of ransomware attacks. Transnet was a particularly high-level one, but there was the Department of Justice. I think it might have been the year before. Uh, there, were, there were other examples. Um, is, is ransomware... I mean, it's certainly if you read the, read the press, it looks like ransomware is a massive problem, is it? Of course it's a problem because if, if cyber criminals steal your data, encrypt it and say, okay, well, it's going to cost you 50 million rand to decrypt this data, there's the problem. That's where data, sec- um, data protection comes in yeah. to play because if, they, if your data, sensitive data is already encrypted, mm-hmm. 
they can steal it as much as they want. They can't do anything with it. So that's where encryption plays a very key role. They're just encrypting encrypted data. (laughs) Correct. So they, they would need a key to decrypt that data before they could even think about holding you at ransom. But in the meantime, the organization that has already encrypted that sensitive data brings up their backup and continues working as usual. Um, And that's where encryption plays a very pivotal role in your security landscape. But I suppose, Karen, there's a challenge then in terms of, you know, a lot of the data that companies are using on a day-to-day basis needs to be real-time. It's real-time operational data. And the, as you've mentioned, there is some challenge in, in encrypting everything, simply mm. all data inside an organization. So I suppose there is a, a risk that you don't want to encrypt too much of your operational data because it starts to impact your operations and your ability to to be a productive company. Um, so I guess uh, you can't protect everything, or am I wrong? Well, when it comes to your sensitive data, there's two facets. You've got data address and data in motion. Okay. So if you say... For example, with the TELUS data protection solutions, you can encrypt data at a file level, a folder level, a database level. It's irrelevant. You choose what you want to encrypt. And that is constantly being encrypted. Mm -hmm. So that is how you mitigate that risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I suppose another potential risk is though is if you if you're a cyber criminal and you're encrypting a company's already encrypted data the company has not doesn't necessarily have a way of decrypting the the, the cyber criminals encrypted data well they couldn't they wouldn't be able to encrypt encrypted data oh they can't no oh. you'd have to decrypt it re-encrypt it so that you've got the key okay pretty much like you're safe at home right or a bank safe, if you don't have the combination to get into that safe, right. there's nothing you can do. Okay. They can't simply take the encrypted files and re-encrypt them. No. Or add a second layer of encryption on top of the encryption. No. Okay. Okay. Interesting. What about um, what about corporate espionage? Uh, is that a is that a real risk? Do, do companies really spy on each other and try and steal, steal their data? And, um, and how do companies protect against that? Um, in terms of corporate espionage, probably not so much in terms of social engineering. Okay. That's a real problem. Um, in fact, there was there was quite a good example. Cartrain, it was public, so yeah. I can mention it. Cyber criminals managed to get hold of one of the internal um, technical guys, mm-hmm. offered him money, threatened him. And threatened him. Mm, yeah, no, they'll they'll resort to anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and they managed to get the data, but fortunately, Hartran had um, measures in place, um, and that actually went to court. Okay, and he ended up going to jail. Interesting, interesting. But how, is it quite prevalent um, corporate espionage? Do you I mean? Do you think to, to what extent are companies trying to hack each other? Not, really. Not as much as companies trying to hack each other, mm-hmm. but potentially using cyber criminals to get information that you need right. um, would be more prevalent. Okay. Okay. And I, I suppose um, training is the the best way of getting around this, training your employees to look out for these Tricks, because at the end of the day, human beings like to be helpful to other people. And if someone cold calls you and says, "I'm looking for this information. I'm a customer." Blah blah blah. Your natural inclination is to want to help that person. Um, you you assume people are good, and you trust people, and you trust them. Mm. Um, so how how do you tackle? That? It's a very much a people issue rather than a technical issue. One hundred percent. I can give a classic example. My mother. Um, she bought a new laptop. Yeah. She came home a few days later. Somebody from Microsoft, Microsoft, <laughs> phoned her on her home phone and said, we see you bought a new laptop. Oh, I've had one of these calls before. We see you don't have <laughs> antivirus. So my mom, being in her 70s, oh, no, I can't, have, I can't not have antivirus. How much is it going to cost me? <laughs> So they said 350 range. She says, well, then I've got to have it. At no point did she think, hmm, let me just ask Karen, because this is actually what she does. Mm. 
or <laughs> why would Microsoft be phoning little old me on my home phone and how would they know if I've got antivirus or not? None of these questions right. entered her mind. Right. So when it came to giving out credit card details, yeah, we happily gave them, yes. including CVV number. Next thing, five and a half thousand rand came off her account. Oh. Um, obviously, she phoned the bank and they stopped it mm -hmm. and she was refunded because it was fraud. Right. Um, some the example, I was in doing some shopping. I had a phone call from MTN. Oh, ma'am, your, your um, a SIM swap is being done on your phone. Please give me the OTP when you receive it mm -hmm. and then I'll be able to stop it. <laughs> I said, um, okay, and I must just assume that you are from MTN. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to phone MTN because they've got a customer number and I'm going to double check for myself because I think you're talking mm -hmm. a lot of nonsense. They hung up immediately. And they hung up. <laughs> <laughs> but they are, I mean, obviously those are all types of phishing attacks and those are just trying to gain, um, what's leaning on your sense of trust in people and maybe ignorance. So yes, mm. training is a very big part of ensuring that your employees understand that clicking on a link in an email from somebody that you don't know not a good idea. Not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you think it should be part of employee induction? It's actually an ongoing thing. I okay. mean, Ultron is very good at that, I must say. Um, we we have these training sessions, even for my team and I, um, that you've got to constantly do all of this training to make sure that, and yes, it's very basic stuff, like, it is basic stuff, but so many people get it wrong. Correct. So it's just really awareness more than anything else. Right. right. Um, because not everybody is in information security, mm. and they do. They will prey on the weakest link. Yeah. Yeah. Your mother or someone who's not tech savvy or… 100%. <laughs> Needless to say, she did feel a bit silly. Um, but they again. did. <laughs> they did actually phone her a second time. Oh, really? And they did not catch her the second time. So she did learn from it. Oh, that's good to hear. That's Unfortunately, to hear. some people don't get their money back mm. and um, remains to be ignorant. But yes, it's a consistent battle trying mm -hmm. to make sure that people are aware. Yeah. Yeah. Let's steer the conversation back to encryption and let's talk a bit about, uh, there's been a lot of new laws and regulations introduced, not just in South Africa, but worldwide over the last five years to deal with, with data privacy, data security. Um, of course, we've got Papaya, the Protection of Personal Information, Information Act, X. and there's GDPR in Europe, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, I think it's called. Correct. Uh, and there are others around the world. Um, are companies taking these laws seriously enough? In South Africa, so obviously Papaya, it was Poppy, Protection of Personal Information, and then it became an X, so then it became Papaya. I don't believe that companies are taking it seriously enough, but if you look at a couple of months ago, Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, they were fined 5 million rand. Mm -hmm. So now it's becoming closer to home. It's sort of... You always seem to think oh, that happens to other companies or mm. other countries, but you'd actually be shocked if you saw what a target South Africa is. I mean, when I focus in infrastructure security, we had a security operations centre monitoring customers' networks, firewalls, intrusion prevention devices. Um, we had everybody, Russia, China trying to hack into our customers' networks. <laughs> so we are not actually as off the radar as we seem to think we are. Mm. I believe our public sector is particularly targeted. Yes. Um, I mean, I've sat, I've sat in a session with one of the public sector um, heads of information security 
and there's a lot of information that they are lacking. Mm-hmm. Um, so from an industry perspective, I think it's really important that we get the message across um, in terms of information security. It's not just mm-hmm. one item, but so is, encryption is, is important. Important in the picture. Is, is um, Papaya helping? It is starting to help because people, it's, once again, it's raised that awareness. So people are starting to take data and privacy more um, seriously. Seriously, And if you look at consumers, they're also more aware of how important their personal information is becoming. Mm. I mean, the banks, for example, have been using um, – have been masking credit card details. So you get the last four digits of the 16 digit credit card number for many years. Mm. Um, But if you look at the, so customers are used to that everyday consumers. However, um, other industries now need to start falling in line. Okay. Are are consumers starting to expect end to end encryption in their dealings with, with corporate entities? If you look at consumers as a whole, um, I think it's still quite a small percentage of the overall consumer base, but it is growing. Mm-hmm. And that's that's because you've got these regulations coming into play. Um, I mean, my husband joined the gym mm-hmm. and the lady trying to sell the gym membership wanted me to put all my banking details in that on an email. I said, I'm not doing that. Mm-hmm. ID, physical address, Mm -hmm. banking details. Email is notoriously insecure. (laughs) No, I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. We'll come in, we'll pay thee, and off you go. Mm -hmm. Um, So he would have been happy to give his personal details out, but then he's also not out of of the IT industry. He's more, he's in the steel industry, so... It's it's still going to take a while. Take a while, yeah, yeah. I must say, I also get very nervous about sending my ID and, and documents, passports, and that over email. So what I tend to do is upload it onto a cloud drive, create a password, and send that password over WhatsApp or something similar, so that it's not sent over an open email, so that they can access those documents without it going over an open communication forum. But I also realise I'm not your average consumer. <laughs> Correct. So you're <laughs> in the IT industry, so we do tend to be a bit more risk averse. Mm. Um. And it's not only ignorance, it's also people are busy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's okay, an inconvenience to have to put it onto done. a cloud share. And 100%. Much easier just to drag it into an email and send it. 100%. Yeah, yeah. I suppose getting over that friction is also a challenge. What about COVID and work from home and um, the way the corporate, the world of work changed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? And I know a lot of people are going back to the office now, but there are still quite a lot of people as well who are working from home or may work two or three days a week from home. And I know there was a lot of concern amongst companies about what this means from a security perspective. Suddenly you've got employees all over the place connecting to the corporate systems over the internet. Some companies deployed VPNs to try and t- to deal with that. Um, are the challenges around security and work from home largely solved now? Or do you think still, it still opens up companies enormously to risk? It's still a challenge. Look, it was... When COVID happened, obviously none of us expected it. Um, you had the big banks with these huge buildings in town. Go to Standard Bank in Johannesburg town. That takes up four blocks um, and there's hardly anybody there. Even pockets have closed. So most people are working from home to this day. I mean, I know of a large bank that actually sent a fire extinguisher and a medical aid kit and a a router to every single one of the employees. Because I think the other side of the coin is companies are starting to realize that if all the employees are working from home or hybrid working, the requirements for infrastructure become a lot less Mm -hmm. in terms of physical infrastructure. It does add complexity in terms of – because now you've got people accessing your corporate systems from a phone, from a tablet, from a laptop. Mm-hmm. Um, Which the IT did not buy. No. Um, so these are all personal devices. So, yeah. yes, you've now – it does add that extra layer, which a lot of companies – 
did a lot of work in a short space of time when COVID hit, um, and that's continuing. Okay. Karen, before I let you go, elevator pitch time. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, point solutions out there uh, in, in the information security industry, and I'm sure the same is true in encryption. Why should companies consider engaging with Ultra on their cryptographic and encryption needs? Well, we do support. Um, TELUS is certainly a force to be reckoned with in that um, space. Okay. Everything they do in terms of the division of TELUS that we work with, because there are multiple divisions around the world, is all, all about encryption. Um, that is our mantra, and we've, they are really good at it, and we are really good at it. Mm -hmm. So we're happy to walk through any um, scenarios with customers. And like I said, we work through a channel. Um, outside of all the solutions I've mentioned, we also do biometric solutions. We are distributors as well. Also working through partners. Are those typically access type solutions or um, how, to take me through that? Either fingerprint, facial biometric. In fact, 20 years ago when I was doing biometric solutions, fingerprint was about as far as you go. Okay. Fingerprint, hand, maybe. Mm -hmm. Facial re um, biometric recognition is now becoming, it was too invasive 20 years ago, but it is now becoming... A oh, your iPhone does standard. it to unlock your phone. <laughs> exactly. So we're happy to discuss any of these solutions with any potential clients. Great. And if anyone wants to find out more about your cryptographic and encryption solutions at Ultron Systems Integration, what is the best place to do that? www.ultronsystemsintegration.co.za. Click on security. All our information is there. Fantastic. Ultron Systems Integration.co.za is the website address. Karen Foss is Senior Manager of Crypto at Ultron Systems Integration. Thanks so much for sharing your insights with Tech Central today. Much appreciated. Thank you so much for your time, Duncan. Thanks, Karen.